Hello everyone, my name is Alex. Welcome to part two of my series on the i3 window manager. In the previous video, I taught you how to install i3 and of course, how to use it. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to customize your i3 installation. Before we can delve in and start to customize i3, I must first introduce you to the i3 configuration file. You'll recall that when you first installed i3, you were asked if you wanted to create a configuration file. I recommended that you did create one. If you did, you should see inside of your home directory, a subdirectory called i3, and inside of that subdirectory, a file called config. This config file is the i3 configuration file, and it's where the majority of the configuration for i3 takes place. If you did not, ask i3 to create a configuration file for you when you install i3, you can run the i3-config-wizard application. This will prompt you to create the configuration file again. However, if you already have a configuration file, the program will exit. This configuration file is simply a text document, which means you can edit it using any text editor. If you're on Ubuntu, you can use Jedit, which is a text editor that comes pre-installed. You can simply type the Jedit command, followed by the path to the config file, which relative from the home directory is .i3 forward slash config. As I run this command, you can see the configuration file opens in its own panel. So throughout this video, we'll be making a bunch of changes to this file. As we make them, I recommend you press the save button up here or click on file and save. I'm going to use a different editor for the purposes of this tutorial. I'm going to use Vim. Vim doesn't come pre-installed with Ubuntu, so I'm going to have to install it manually. And then similar to how you would open the config file in Jedit, I will type the name of the text editor Vim and then the relative path to the config file, which is .i3 forward slash config. Now, the reason why I'm using Vim in these tutorials is because comments, which are the lines prefixed with pound symbols, are highlighted in blue and actual instructions are highlighted in white. This will make it easier for me to explain what's happening. Also, I can enable line numbers very quickly as I'm familiar with this editor and that will help me refer to the lines I'm working with. The first thing I'll teach you is how to create a custom key binding. You'll recall in the previous video that I taught you how to lock your computer. The process entailed opening a terminal and writing the i3 lock command. Whilst that's not too tedious, it's a little bit monotonous to have to open the terminal and write the command every time you want to lock your computer. It would be much nicer if we could create a custom key binding. So in other words, I want to make it so that when I press mod plus shift plus x, the i3 lock command will be executed. I can do that via the configuration file. So I'm gonna go back to the config file and go all the way to the bottom. I'm gonna create a new line and write bind sim dollar mod plus shift plus x exec i3 lock. I'll explain this in a second, but first let me save the document and then I'll try and press mod shift and x to see what happens. So I'll press mod shift and x and nothing happens. In fact, because i3 is not interpreting that shortcut, the Vim editor is. And as you can see, as I press mod, shift and X, it is deleting the currently focused character. I'll undo those changes and resave the document and I'll explain why this is not working. Basically, we've saved the configuration, but we have not yet applied those changes. To do that, press mod, shift and R. Mod, shift and R is the key binding to restart i3. Once you restart i3, your new configuration will take effect. Now, when I press mod, shift and X, the screen actually logs. Okay, now you've seen that works, let me explain what's going on here in a little bit more detail. Basically, bind sim is the configuration for binding system keys. We then specify which keys we're binding and then to which action. So you can think of this command as reading, when the system keys mod plus shift plus x are pressed, execute i3 lock. Next, I'll teach you how to change existing key bindings. Something sort of interesting about i3 is that all of the defaults are defined inside of this configuration file. When you opened this file, it wasn't empty, was it? That's because all of the key bindings that I taught you in the previous video and all of the key bindings you're still yet to discover are defined in this file. If I go to the top of the file, you can see that, for example, there is a key binding for mod plus shift plus Q, which executes the kill command. You'll recall that the mod plus shift plus Q command quits the current window. Similarly, we have a command here to launch D menu when dollar mod plus D is pressed. Now, in the last video, X for me asked if it was possible to change the default key binding for the run menu. 
yes, it's absolutely possible. All I have to do in this case is replace the key binding here. Say for instance, I want to bind the mod plus X keys to D menu. I can make that change, save the file, press mod shift and R to restart i3 in place. And now when I press mod plus X, D menu is launched at the top there. If I press mod plus D, nothing happens. I think specifically though, what X for me wanted to do was bind mod plus R to D menu, which makes perfect sense because D menu is a program runner. The trouble is mod plus R is already in use by the resize key binding. If I search the document for resize, I think it's actually just beneath this block. Yeah, you can see that the mod plus R key is already bound to this command, which means if I save this file and restart i3 by pressing mod shift and R, we'll get an error. Can you see this red banner at the top here? If I click the button called show errors, you can see the error duplicate key binding in config file. So we can't do that by default, but what we could do is we could then replace the R for this command with X, for example, that will then make it unreserved, but that now when I save the file and restart i3, the error is no longer there. Me, personally, I don't really like to mess with the default key bindings too much because it will get very confusing as you start shuffling key bindings around. So whilst I don't recommend it, it's totally possible. I think now would be a good time to take a brief intermezzo to introduce you to the iFree documentation. To access the documentation, go to your browser and go to ifreewm.org. At the top here, you'll see a navigation item for the docs, click it, and what you really want to read is this user's guide. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because it's a good time to mention that whilst I'm going to cover a fair amount of ground in this tutorial, I can't possibly cover the entire breadth of i3. For example, at the moment, I'm teaching you about keyboard bindings, but for example, it's also possible to configure mouse bindings, which is something I'm not going to talk about. So if you are looking to learn more about i3 outside of this video, I highly recommend you check out the docs. It's very well written, very concise and full of actual examples, which is great for kinesthetic learners like me. With that brief intermezzo out of the way, I want to take another moment to address what I anticipate will be a common problem relating to media keys, volume keys, screen brightness keys, and touchpad keys. Basically, out of the box, none of those sorts of keys will work on i3. Simply put, i3 does not understand how to process them. You must first configure i3 before those key bindings will work. Fortunately, this is a common problem for which a solution already exists. I found an answer on this website that entails a snippet that you can simply copy and paste into the bottom of your configuration file. Of course, there'll be a link to this website in the show notes. Unfortunately, I use i3 on a desktop computer, which means I've never used the touchpad or screen brightness controls, so I'm going to remove those. The pulse audio controls work really well on Ubuntu. Basically, we're using that same bind sim command to say that when the audio raise volume button is pressed, we should execute the following command. As you can see, this particular handler uses an application called Pactol to control the volume. Pactol comes pre-installed on Ubuntu, which means these commands should work brilliantly on Ubuntu out of the box. However, if you're on a different Linux distribution, you may find that Pactol is not installed and you'll need to install it manually. The player controls work much in the same way. We say that when the audio play button is pressed, we should execute the player CTL application with the argument play. The same is true for the pause, next and previous buttons, just with their own respective arguments. Unfortunately, player CTL is not pre-installed on Ubuntu, which means we'll have to install it manually. What's more, there is no package for it in any of the predefined repositories, so we'll have to go and download the Debian package manually. The first step to do that is to go to your browser and search for player CTL on GitHub. Click on the first and most obvious link. Under the releases page, you should see a download for the Debian package. Click on it and you should be prompted to save the file. I'm going to go back to workspace one and open a new terminal, navigate into that downloads directory. If I list all of the files, you should see the player CTL Debian package. I can install it by typing sudo dpkg i and then the name of the package. Enter my password and just like that, player CTL should be installed. We can verify it's installed by looking at the help page. Now, when I use the media or volume keys on my keyboard, my system should respond. 
Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that as I'm in a virtual machine, but if you have any doubt, just try it yourself and I'm sure it will work if you follow my steps exactly. Next, we're gonna move away from the keyboard to look at how we can make applications automatically load with i3. In other words, how to make it so that when we log into i3, some applications will be automatically loaded. Say for the purposes of this demonstration, I want to make Rhythmbox automatically load with i3. Rhythmbox is a media player and it's something that you might realistically want to load with i3. Me, personally, I always load my media player with i3. To make Rhythmbox load with i3, go to the bottom of your configuration file and simply write exec for execute and then the name of the application, which in this case is Rhythmbox. Of course, it doesn't have to be Rhythmbox. You could write, for example, Firefox here or Skype or any other application, but I will just do Rhythmbox. When you save the file and restart i3, you'll notice that nothing happens. This is because by default, outside of the context of a key binding, EXEC will only work when you first log into i3. And when you think about it, this kind of makes perfect sense because you wouldn't want to, for example, close Rhythmbox, go and change your configuration file, restart i3 and have Rhythmbox pop up every time you restart your desktop. It'd be kind of irritating. Nonetheless, the only way I can demonstrate this is by logging out and then logging back in. As you can see, Rhythmbox is loaded. Say for example though, you do want to make Rhythmbox load every time you restart your desktop. You can do that by writing exec underscore always. Save the file now and then restart i3. And as you can see, Rhythmbox loads. If I close it and then restart i3, Rhythmbox loads. It makes me sort of laugh because it's almost ridiculous when it comes to applications. But there is a very valid use case for the exe underscore always uh, a configuration that I'll show you in just a second when we look at how to create a custom wallpaper. Next, I'll show you how to set a custom wallpaper in i3. You might expect that if you went to your browser and sort of picked out a nice wallpaper, that you could save this file, sort of right click it and then press set as wallpaper. In i3, that won't work. What you must do firstly is right click on the photo and save it to your file system. I've saved mine to the pictures directory and renamed it to wallpaper.jpg. To set the wallpaper, you're going to need to install an additional application. There are a few options here, but I like to use an application called Feh, that's F-E-H, which I can install by writing sudo apt-get install Feh. I'll enter my password, and just like that, Feh will be installed. But for now, I can access the Feh command, specify an argument, namely dash dash bg scale, and then the path to the wallpaper relative from the current directory, as I'm already in the pictures directory, I can just write wallpaper.jpg. Now, before I run this command, let me show you an empty workspace. See how the wallpaper is for default, Ubuntu 1510 wallpaper. But as I press enter to run this command, you can see that the wallpaper now changes. So we're done, right? No, not quite. You'll notice that if you log out of i3 and then log back in, that the wallpaper has been restored to the default Ubuntu wallpaper. This is because the application we used Fair is ephemeral. The change it makes only lasts for the duration of the user session. As soon as you log out, i3 basically forgets that you ever set a custom wallpaper. Therefore, when you log in again, it just shows you the default wallpaper. To rectify this problem, we need to execute the same fair program with those same arguments every time we log into i3. We can do that using the same technique I showed you previously. So go to your configuration file. At the very bottom, write exec underscore always feh specify any arguments that you might want to specify such as bg dash scale and then specify an absolute path to the wallpaper in my case it's going to be in my home folder which is called booker because that's my username obviously you'll want to replace this with your own username and the wallpaper is called wallpaper.jpg I'll save the file, but before restarting i3, let me just go to an empty workspace and show you that the wallpaper is the default. I restart i3 and now the wallpaper has been updated. Hopefully now you can see why this exec underscore always command is actually useful for certain commands. In the case of Rhythmbox, it makes no sense to execute Rhythmbox every time you restart i3. However, in the case of fair, it makes a lot of sense because say you want to change your wallpaper, you can just replace that file and then restart i3 and the wallpaper will propagate. It makes it really easy to change your wallpaper in the future. 
One more thing I think I ought to explain before I move on is this dash dash bg dash scale argument that I supply to the fair application. You'll recall that in most conventional operating systems, when you set the wallpaper, you have an option to either sort of stretch or scale or center or tile the wallpaper. Well, in fair, there is no graphical user interface, so I specify that option via an argument. BG scale isn't the only option. If you look at the man page for fair and search for BG scale, you can see where there are other options like BG center and BG fill. Next, I want to talk about how to configure monitors in i3. By default, there is no graphical user interface for editing monitor settings. There is only a command line utility called xranda, which if you look at the help page, there are a bunch of arguments that relate to the position, resolution, and orientation of monitors. But as you can probably imagine, Trying to express the position of your monitors using command line arguments can be a bit difficult. It's for that reason that I highly recommend you use a graphical based tool called ARANDER. ARANDER is essentially a graphical user interface that sits on top of XRANDER. When you make setting changes and hit apply, it basically calls the XRANDER program under the hood. ARANDER, however, is not installed on Ubuntu by default. To install it, go to the command line and write sudo app-get install a rander. Enter your password and a rander should install. Once a rander is installed, you should be able to open it via D menu like so. As you can see, it closely resembles other operating system setting windows for monitors. If I had multiple monitors, I'd be able to drag them around like this to configure their position. I can right click on any monitor to change the resolution or orientation. It just so happens because I'm running my computer inside of a virtual machine, I don't really need to make any changes. But say you make your changes, you can just hit apply and those changes will take effect. However, much like the fair command that we looked at previously to set the wallpaper, the changes are ephemeral. As soon as you log out, i3 will forget them. If you want to apply these changes on a more permanent basis, Press the save button and you'll be prompted to save the xrando command that arando generates internally to disk. You can then execute that xrando command when you log into i3 using the same techniques I've showed you previously. I'll call this file foo, which is a gibberish word, because I'm only saving it for the purposes of extracting its contents. I'll delete it afterwards. I'll open the terminal and using the cat application, I can list the contents of the foo.sh file. It looks like ARANDA added the sh extension for me. As you can see internally, we have a shebang that indicates to Linux that this is a shell file. Beneath that, we have the xrando command and all of its arguments that we don't have to write. It just so happens in this case that most of these arguments are redundant, especially because I didn't really make any changes to my file. But if you did, for example, change your resolution or screen position, these arguments would be very valuable to you. I'm going to copy those and then I'm going to open my config file. At the very bottom, I'm going to paste the command and prefix it with exec underscore always. This way, whenever I restart the i3 desktop, that command is going to be executed. Thus, if I want to make a change, for example, to the resolution, I can just restart the desktop and it will take effect. Of course, you could optionally write just exec and that way it will only be executed when you log in. Okay everyone, I've closed down everything so we can focus on our next topic which is workspaces. To configure workspaces, you do so from the same configuration file you've been using throughout this video. Specifically though, search for workspace and you'll find the configurations relating to workspaces. As you can see for each of the key bindings I described in the previous video, there are corresponding bind sim configurations. In this particular case, we're saying when we press mod plus one, we should execute the workspace command. Preceding that workspace command is the name of the workspace. By default, the workspaces are simply named one through 10, but if you want, you can rename the workspace to anything. For example, I'll rename my first workspace to terminals. I'll save this file and press mod shift and R and nothing happens. What I recommend you do is log out and log back in for these changes to take effect. As you can see, the workspace is no longer called one, it's called terminals. Ignore the fact that Rhythmbox, a music player, 
is loading on his workspace called terminals for now. We'll address that problem in a little bit. For now though, let's go back to the configuration file and configure some more things relating to the workspaces. If I scroll down a little bit here, you can see that there is a further command relating to workspace one that says when I press mod plus shift plus one, I free should move the current container to the workspace with the identifier one. There is no such workspace as we renamed it to terminals, which means if we, for example, create a second workspace and open a terminal and press mod shift and one, it does create a workspace called one, even though we removed it above. To rectify that problem, I'm going to have to use my mouse to click on the workspace number one, because if I press mod plus one, it's going to take me to the terminals workspace. We've kind of made ourselves in an inconsistent state where we can't actually access workspace one via the keyboard anymore because we removed that key binding. So let me go to workspace number one with my mouse, close this window, go back to the terminals workspace, and I'm simply going to rename this to terminals. Now I'll save this restart the desktop environment and now when I create a new terminal on workspace number two and press mod shift one it gets moved to the correct workspace. But previously I said that you should log out for those changes to take effect. You don't really have to log out it's just that if you don't you might find yourself in a similarly inconsistent state so it's up to you whether or not you want to log out. Here's a little tip for you at the moment if you want to rename a workspace for example to rename workspace two to maybe firefox you have to remember to rename the workspace in two places, which you might forget to do. What's more, if you, for example, make a typo in one of the workspace names, they won't be referring to the same workspace and you'll get into a similarly inconsistent state. Generally, having to rename a value in two places is considered to be an anti-pattern and very error prone. To rectify this solution, i3 configuration files support variables. You can come anywhere in the configuration file above the use of the variable and write set the name of the variable, which in this case will be dollar workspace one, and then the value of the variable, which will be terminals in this case. Now, anywhere where you see the value terminals, you can replace it with workspace one. You can do the same down here. And of course, we'll also create a second variable for the second workspace, which will be workspace two. The value will be Firefox. And anywhere we see Firefox, we'll replace it with workspace two. I wish, by the way, that the configuration file would do this out of the box because it's really only useful when you now change your workspace name in the future. Say, for example, I want to rename terminals to, I don't know, editor. Well, I make that change in one place. We start the desktop environment I'm going to actually log out and log back in because I don't want to be in an inconsistent state. And as you can see, the workspace is now called editor. If I create a window on a second workspace and press mod shift and one, it goes to the correct workspace. I only had to make the change in one place and I've done it in such a way that it's very difficult to get wrong. I recommend you do the same thing. I'm going to create an additional workspace. Uh, I'll make it workspace 10 and I'll make its value uh, music because it's going to host any music players. I'll need to remember to come down here and rename 10 to dollar workspace 10 and also to come down here and replace 10 with dollar workspace 10. Basically, by the way, when i3 interprets this configuration file, anywhere it sees the text dollar workspace 10, it's going to simply replace it with the value music. And the same is true for the other variables as well. I'm going to save this file and reapply the changes by pressing mod shift and R. And now when I press modern zero, it will take me to the music workspace. As you can see, if I create a container on another workspace and press mod shift and zero, it will take it to the music workspace. Actually, what I want to do is open the ribbon box, move that to workspace 10. By the way, I recommend you prefix all of your workspaces with their numbers. This way they will always be in a consistent order. This is a prime example of why I want to log out and log back in because I'm actually, I've got two of these free workspaces open. And if I was to start trying to use my system, it would just be all kinds of messed up. So let me log out and log back in real quick. Okay, we're logged back in. And as you can see, the workspace is called one colon editor. If I press mod two, you can see it's called two Firefox. And if I press mod zero, you can see it's called 10 music. We're encountering a problem for the second time, which is that Rivenbox, a music player, is automatically loading on workspace one which has the label editor, when really it belongs on workspace 10, which has the label music. 
it is possible to make i3 for certain windows to open on a particular workspace and I'm going to show you how to do that next. Firstly, open the configuration file and then navigate to the general proximity of the other workspace configurations and create a new line. We'll fill in this line in just a second, but first we need to find out the Rhythmbox's Windows class. Every window in i3 has a class. To find out the class, open the application whose class you want to find, in my case it's Rhythmbox, then open the terminal and type in xprop. Watch the cursor as I press enter. See how it changes to a kind of crosshair? I can now click on Rhythmbox and there will, it will give me information about the window, including the class. Copy the second value, in this case capital R, Rhythmbox. Then go back to your editor and write assign inside of square brackets, class equals, and then inside of double quotes, the name of the class, and then specify the workspace you want to force that window to open on. In this case, it'll be workspace 10. It's another good reason to have variables because now we're referring to workspace 10 in three places, which if we had to do without variables would be a nightmare to maintain. I'll save this file now and restart i3. I'll quickly head over to workspace number 10 and delete everything, or rather close everything. And now watch as I open Rhythmbox. It automatically creates workspace 10. If I navigate there, Rhythmbox is open. Better yet, if I log out, and log back in. You can see that the editor workspace is empty and the music workspace is being created on it is Rhythmbox. I think this is really good because it will help you always know where to find windows. Something I think a lot of people will be interested in doing is associating icons with their workspaces. For example, for the second workspace, which is reserved for Firefox, you might want to associate the Firefox icon. To do that, you must first install a font that has icons I recommend Font Awesome. To install it, head over to Firefox and then head over to uh, github.com forward slash Fort Awesome forward slash Font Dash Awesome. There'll be a link in the description. Click on Releases and then click on the zip link beneath the latest version, which at this time is 4.40. You'll be prompted to save the zip file. Hit OK. Once the download is complete, head over to your terminal navigate to your downloads directory you should see a file called fontawesome.zip to unzip it simply write unzip and then the path to the zip file if you relist the files in that directory you should see now a folder called font-awesome-the version number navigate inside of that directory you should see another subdirectory called fonts which you can then change directory into and inside of there you'll see the fonts in a bunch of different versions what we want is the ttf version Firstly, to install this font, make a directory in your home directory called dot fonts using the above command. Then simply move the TTF font into that directory using this command. If I navigate now to my home directory and then into the dot fonts directory, you should see that TTF font. Next, it's simply a case of looking up the font awesome cheat sheet. and then searching for the icon you want, which in my case will be Firefox, copying the icon, heading back to your config file, searching for the workspace, and then simply pasting the icon inside of the string literal. Now in this particular case, inside of the editor, it looks a bit malformed. After you log out and log back in, it should look better. As I press mod two, notice how the Firefox icon is associated with the workspace. Here, let me log out and log back in to show you the final product. Okay, notice how I press mod plus two, the Firefox window has the Firefox icon, nice. If I go to my editor workspace and open up the config file, search for Firefox, you can see that the icon is actually rendered properly inside of the editor now. Good stuff, right? It's really not that hard and you can use that cheat sheet to find any other kind of icon you might want to associate with any workspace. Okay, everyone, that's all we've really got time for today. 
Honestly, when I was recording the first video, I thought I would be able to cover everything else in the second video, but I've just run out of time. This video has been going on for a long time already. In the next video, we're going to look at how to make i3 look wonderful by customizing the color scheme and also the color of the bar and the windows and that kind of stuff. We're also going to look at how to improve the bar, which is this black strip at the bottom here. We're going to make it look a lot nicer and make it serve a more practical purpose. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like or a comment. And if you loved it, please consider subscribing.